IP is all about you know, protection, creating monopolies. And there's one phrase that perhaps even after uh, this presentation is done, I'd like you to remember. The business of business is business. We are all busy creating things. But why are we creating them? There's an end game. And so please remember, as we get busy, the busyness of business is business. So my name is Nancy, and I'm grateful to my colleague uh, from the Trademark Hotel, uh, who's going to be flipping the uh, slides as we go ahead. I normally don't say much of my name, because I always, always want to introduce myself at the end, because uh, the strategy is that you must not remember my name, but remember what I did say. So let's roll on the slides, please. So all we're doing is uh, leveraging your intellectual property rights for protection. The presentation that I'm going to give you will be just, you know, really trying to answer main questions. Firstly, I'm going to just run a brief overview on the Kenya IPR legal framework. Then as business people and decision makers, I think when you're here, you're least interested in knowing the practical procedures of how to go to keep it to register your trademarks. But because you're decision makers, I thought I'd break it down to main questions. What, why, how, when? And this is what I'm going to be addressing. What can be registered as a trademark in Kenya? I will narrow it down to trademarks for the reasons that I'll mention. Why must your business register as trademarks or other IPRs in Kenya? How can I register the trademark? and other uh, IPRs in Kenya and abroad. And again, the abroad aspect, I think I'll deal with it. And then as we're talking about trademarks, I'll talk a bit about the Kenya uh, anti counter uh, uh, fitting authority recorders that are quite tropical lately. And then I'll also answer the question, when must you register your IPRs in Kenya? Let's go on. So the first part that I'm going to be dealing is the Kenya IPR legal framework. And we can flip over. Um, again, that's my daughter, you know, you know, who really just, you know, um, makes me try to think outside the box. And I thought instead of actually giving you the rundown of what is, what is, what is, let me just put them together as a flower. That's how best I can remember them. So um, I want to start not with trademarks, but to end with trademarks. So normally when we talk about intellectual property rights some people just think it's one it's not and most people think you know we operate them in business as silos we don't so the main one is patents patents are to do with innovations you know uh, you know that you have created they must be industrially applicable they must apply to science and agriculture they must be novel so that's the higher end uh, of intellectual property rights Utility models, or what people call petty patents, are similar to patents, but with a lesser requirement for novelty. Designs, perfume bottles, for example. Sometimes people do not buy the perfume or the product because of what's inside. How many of us, I want to you know, show a hands, if you are buying a perfume, do you actually read the label and say, um, here, here there is is uh, ginger, there's an orange blossom, or we buy them because the bottling looks good. What inspires you to buy a product? Even if it is an electric kettle or an iron, sometimes form and function gather together aesthetically, and I will pick the iron because it looks hot and it looks cool and it suits my kitchen. Just like you're putting a kitchen, uh, a kettle in the kitchen, it's not just because you want something that will boil the water hot or something that you press your clothes, but you want something that looks aesthetically appealing. Just like if you're picking a partner, you don't often say, is this person intelligent? Otherwise, some of us who are short and fat would never have partners. But you simply say, is this person aesthetically appealing? And then from there, things happen. But that's really what it is like in business, whether we like it or not. TK and NGR. TK is traditional knowledge and genetic resources. These are also forms of uh, intellectual property. GIs are geographical indications. These are becoming more and more famous. For example, when you say champagne, 
We are not thinking that you are selling a, an alcoholic beverage that is coming from South Africa. It is associated with the geographical region of Champagne. Much as we say coffee Kenya, it's coming from, from Kenya. So it is a particular taste, a particular uh, emotional attachment that brings you back to Kenya. So it is actually associated with the geographical region and that is why we call them geographical indications. Plant varieties, um, blueberries, oranges, when people are planting them, sometimes they want to look uh, for a variety that is, for example, climate resistant, like my previous uh, speaker said, or you want something that is going to do fruition three times a year instead of one, or if it is mangoes, you don't want the thread mangoes. You want the one, a variety that doesn't have thread and you don't have to worry about your teeth. So these are the varieties that we always protect. Copyright. For most business people, you have a website. You have taken time to create the content that is appearing on your website. So copyright does not protect ideas, but it protects forms of expression. So the way you have put your information, you've taken time, effort, energy to apply it. So the law of copyright will protect you from substantial copying of something that you have produced. Then I go to trademarks. I think for this one, let's flip over so that I can actually give a good case study on it later. Before I go to, trademark, uh, to trademarks, there are also trade secrets, but I'll link them together when I give you the case study of the Coca-Cola bottle. There are some things that you just do not protect based on patents, but you want to keep them secret. For example, KFC will say we've got a secret source. We've got a secret way of making things. And when you ask, they don't tell you because the essence of their competitive edge lies in that secret recipe. But for them to be protectable, they have to meet three requirements. It must be commercially valuable. It must be known by a limited group of people. That's a secret, isn't it? And they must be subject to reasonable steps taken by the right holder to keep the information secret. So once you've got these three, you can now say you've got trade secrets. So they are anchored, you can flip over, by the laws of contract and by the laws of uh, employment. Um, you know, you get your employees to sign a non-disclosure agreement so that you, you, you know, your secret is not divulged. So in summary, I mean, trademarks, I'll come to them. They are registrable in perpetuity, but subject to renewal every 10 years in most jurisdictions. Patents, almost the world over, they are generally registrable for 20 years, particularly in Kenya. Utility models, generally 10. Uh, designs in Kenya, they are registrable initially for five years and then subject to two renewal terms. So five years plus five plus five is equal to 15 years. Copyright, it is uh, not a registrable right. So in this term, they're not registrable rights. It subsists upon the creation of a work. And in terms of its protection, in most jurisdictions, it's the lifetime of the author plus 50 years. G uh, GIs, normally will, some will register them as collective trademarks, but in most jurisdictions, we are moving towards what we call a sui generis or a standalone GI law. And this is something that is provided for in the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement, uh, commonly known as TRIPS. And I must mention that Kenya is also part of the ad hoc committee that AFRIPI is working with in terms of creating a model law of uh, GIs for African uh, states. Trade secrets, as I mentioned, they are protected by contract and employment law. So you have to know what you put in this contract. New plant varieties in Kenya, they are, they are protected as registrable rights under KFIS, which is the Kenya Plant Health Inspector Service. So if you may just flip over. All right, and I'm now going to come uh, to trademarks. Um, in, we all know the history of the Coca-Cola, I, I think, business for some time. But after it was created, they faced a number of uh, challenges because uh, other companies came up, Nola Cola, Ma Coca-Cola, 
cola, whatever. And they all wanted to create uh, the same and replicate the same drink because it was successful. So you'll see that from 1989, the bottle was almost generic. Almost every drink was like that. And there was an evolution. When they came to the third one, that diamond shape, it was peeling off. And then they tried another one, it was still peeling off. And then before they got to 1916, if I may share the history, and this is courtesy, I think, of uh, the Coca-Cola website. Their lawyer called Harold Hash then led uh, a, a plea to the bottling community to unite behind a distinctive package. And I want to quote this because it will really frame our discussion. When he was addressing the bottlers, he said, and I'll try to imitate what I believe his voice was, authoritative. We are not building Coca-Cola alone for today. We are building Coca-Cola forever. And it is our hope that Coca-Cola will remain the national drink to the end of time. What does this say about our businesses? When we are leveraging intellectual property, Oftentimes, we are trying to look at extending the legacy of our businesses, not to be businesses of today, but to be businesses until the end of time, whatever end of time that is. So we are looking for that. What else are we also looking for? I think when, uh, let me just read uh, this one. So the Coca-Cola company commissioned 500, at that time it was a lot of money, 500 US dollars for a competition uh, into the Coca-Cola bottle. Let me just see. Um, so what was then, what then happened is that uh, when they started uh, doing that, they said they wanted a Coca-Cola bottle that somebody could identify even at night, even when you're lying broken down, so that you could not just see it visually, but you could also feel it and it would encompass something else. So most of our trademarks have to be distinctive. They have to draw in the emotions, visual, oral, and everything. So they eventually came up with the Coca-Cola bottle with the Spencerian script. And to this date, this bottle remains very, very distinctive. So whenever we're talking of trademarks, there are quite a number of things that we are talking about. One, it must be distinctive. Two, it must try to last for as ever as we think it is possible. Three, it must try to create a culture. Four, it must try to uh, generate a lot of people to buy into the product. And what I like about that one, and I'll end from the quote for the Coca-Cola, they said, what is great about this country is that America started the tradition where consumers, whether rich or poor, are essentially using and buying the same things as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and you can think, I might also just drink Coca-Cola. Even the bum at the corner is drinking Coca-Cola. All Cokes are the same. All Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it. The president knows it. The bum knows it. And what's more important, you know it. So this is the running effect of a trademark. Whether you are rich or poor, whatever you are buying, whether it's goods or services, it's Nike. Everyone who can afford to buy Nike will still feel the same fabric of it. So that is what we really talk about trademarks when we say they must be distinctive. So let's flip over again as we go to that one. As I did mention, trademarks seldom operate in silos. They operate in an integrated manner. So normally you can have, for example, the example of a tablet. The tablet chemical content is protected by a patent. The shape may be protected by a design. The name of the product, whether it's uh, Amazon, that is a trademark. So all three of them are together. And then we must also be careful of which IPRs to use. That means we have to think about our product and decide which one are we going to use. Is it going to be a trade secret? Or is it going to be a trademark? Or is it going to be a patent? How long does it take to register? What do we get? So these are things that your lawyers generally will advise you about, but you need to know. So the lesson that we learned from the Coca-Cola bottle in terms of IPR. Number one, 
We always must remember the justification to protect your IP. What is it that you want to do to leverage your intellectual property rights? So in this case, the justification was they were tired of competitors who were overriding on their brand, even choosing to call their businesses as close as Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Makoka, everything is overriding. Remember, imitation is a way of acknowledging competition. When you do good, people want to imitate. But you have spent hours building and working hard to come up with something, but you don't want people to simply leverage on what you have done. And then so again, that can also be there. They were trying to address challenges uh, that had been made during the evolution of the design process. This required cost, ingenuity, and time. So again, this is what intellectual property rights try to do, to reward and incentivize innovation. Competitors are ruthless. I would have said heartless, but I think that would be biologically incorrect. They have a heart, but they are ruthless. They are mutual friends. That's why they're called competitors. So as your business, you always have to understand that if the business of business is business, then make sure that you protect your goodwill, your reputation, so that no one comes closer to it. You might be many things to your IPRs. Remember what Coca-Cola said, we want a bottle to outlive all time. So you must always have a strategic, forward-looking, intentional, and optimization a survival strategy for your life so that you make it hard for the competition. Let's flip over. So before I <laughs> move over, I, I don't want to always act like I'm preaching. Um, so as you know, uh, before, before I refuse to take your questions, I have an opening statement. That was Ronald Reagan. And the next one is asking questions is the first way of beginning to change. So I would like some questions as we flip over. Which forms of IPR, if I can just get a hint, do you use the most in your business? Are there any takers? Trademarks? Thank you. Yes. We've got trademarks here. Hello. 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 Hi. Thank you, Nancy, for this comprehensive view about uh, IP. Um, uh, I arrived to Nairobi in Nairobi last July, and I'm dealing with agriculture. One thing that I astonished me is how little institutions know about the potential of TK and GR in this such a rich in biodiversity countries. I think one of the most prominent uh, things that should be highlighted in this kind of gathering in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Africa in general, is about TK and GRs. Okay, could you illuminate us, which are the ways in which we could perhaps embrace that and sensitivize institutions to understand that this is an amazing richness that is uh, hidden, it is unnoticed almost by, by the institutions. And particularly agricultural institutions think uh, IP is a little bit of uh, too much connected with legal issues. And uh, when it comes to TKGRs, then the conventional IP system is, is not helping really. So illuminate us, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I've got TK and GRs. Yes. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Back to your question. Um, as a consumer, I interact a lot uh, with uh, utility models, but from a business point, also trademarks gets to carry the day. Okay, thank you. So we've got utility models and uh, trademarks. Okay. And maybe last one so that we can move. Okay, all right. So we can flip over um, and see to going to slide number 14. Let's move. Yes, okay. So there we've got trademarks. We've got utility models from uh, the, the ones are linked utility models and designs together. Then we had uh, TK and GRs. Okay, so in terms of um, that one, let me start with 
trademarks. Please roll on. Okay, with trademarks, what we can do is they come in all forms. We've got words, devices, composite marks, slogans, series marks, uh, series marks again, 3D numbers. Let's flip over and then I can explain them. So there we might have all sorts of them. Some are just words, as you can see. Some are series. When we say series marks, it's like the sky. You see sky in, in orange, in blue, and with a black. Same as the free bank, free bank, free bank. That is a series mark. And then others are logos because they co co contain a word like aquafreeze and something that triggers the mind. Same as Libra. Some can be uh, payoff lines for a balanced planet. Some are, uh, are, are just slogans, flaming hot. And others are just you know, words uh, such as that, um, Uda. And then let's flip over to the next one. I'll still answer your questions. Let's flip over. Okay. So with trademarks, what people will often do is, if we look at these uh, trademarks, what we've got daily sun, as you can see, the first one with the red, that one is used in South Africa for a newspaper. Someone might copy, but they don't want to copy slavishly. So they'll come with a daily and they put the device of a sun. And then someone will say, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, in the image of the sun. And someone can say daily sun. If they're used for the same uh, goods and services, would you say these trademarks are the same? If you're running a business, would you be concerned? You're saying yes, sir? Okay, any other view? Would you be concerned? <laughs> okay, so you, you know, if you're using the same goods and services, yes, you'd be concerned because in one, some people might copy it uh, as it appears visually. So that is uh, strict identicality. They're strictly identical. Someone would copy the conceptual uh, appropriation of the trademark. They've taken your trademark, but then they've put the word daily and they put the desired device. So that would be uh, concerning. Someone has stylized it and they've put daily sun, it's still the same. And someone has put Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's still the same in the device. So you would be concerned uh, with that, okay? And then let's flip over. For trademarks, these are some of the pointers. If you want to register, like the question was, how do we uh, protect them? So consider the profile of your target market. And these are some of the pointers. Some words need to be simple. For example, Schweppes. How many of us, if you close your eyes, can you spell Schweppes? Some people Schweppes, Schweppes. And in some countries like in Asia, it was difficult to roll out because it's, it's difficult. You know, consider the market. Um, and then if you look at John Deere, because the equipment is sometimes used by people who are not illiterate, who are not literate, so they use the colors, the green and the yellow. All they know is I've seen a tractor, it's green and yellow, it must be John Deere. You know, so consider those things. Phrases, sometimes they are popular because they just roll out. Just think of Nike, just do it. So even if you don't see the swoosh sign and you just see somebody wearing, just do it, you automatically link that to, to Nike, isn't it? Because it has become popularized and it's an easier way of it. Colors, they're often important. You see that in banks, most of the times they'll use the color blue because they say blue is the color of trust. For other businesses, let's say cosmetics, they might use green because they are saying it's uh, associated with uh, genuine uh, you know, um, products and you know, then they will use it that one. Pharmaceuticals, we generally use very distinctive, but often <laughs> unheard of names like tremadol, whatever it is, is to make sure that it is as difficult as possible. Let's move over. Um, composite logos, you might want to combine everything like Nike and then you put just do it. That is generally done at the beginning. There's also a cycle, egg lover, pupa, adult. When you're trying to introduce your brand to the market, it might help to put the name and the logo so that people understand it. 
then gradually you phase out the, the logo and you just remain with the pay offline. Just like with Nike, they started as Nike, then they started putting the swoosh, and now you can just see the swoosh sign. You don't need to see Nike or just do it. So that can also be important. Um, pay offlines, they're a quick way to assimilate a brand into society. Let's move over. Before I go to why, so let me now just go to the TK, the questions that I received. TK and GR, um, traditional knowledge and genetic resources. You are right. These are new things that we in Africa can generally use and in developing countries. And a lot of work is now being done by the World Intellectual Property Organization to try to bring TK. In Aripo, uh, the regional organization at which my Afripi branch is based, they actually have a protocol. It's called the Swakumpun Protocol for the protection of traditional knowledge uh, and folklore. And it also protects traditional knowledge and genetic resources. I think uh, right now we've got four member states that have joined. We need a fifth member and it's happening very soon. Then the protocol will come into effect. I, yes, and Kenya is a member of Aripo, so hopefully when they join, there will be, uh, the, the, the protocol will come into operation. But to address your question, yes, even at regional level, something has been done. So it is uh, something that I hope that will address you know, your, your concern. It, it is receiving attention. But in terms of other countries, there's still a lot of policy work that has to be done. And we need to work, and that's where AFRIPI also comes into being. We do awareness raising. We also work with policymakers so that one, they become aware of these resources that they are sitting on. And then two, we try to work together in trying to create legal frameworks in terms of which these resources are going to be expressed. In terms of utility models and trademarks, I am actually very happy to see or to hear uh, that you know your business is uh, handling utility models. So I didn't, I didn't get your name. Gloria, thank you very, very much. Because utility models are low hanging fruit for most African uh, economies because they do not require the higher expertise such as patents. But these are functional you know, additives that you have. A bottle opener, it, it's a utility model. Something that is functional, that can work, and it's quick. And the protection is also you know, taking into account that these are small innovations. It's not for 20 years, but it's for a, a, a shorter period. So it might be a good idea to actually work with your utility model. You give it a name, and it's a trademark, and then you put on a website what you're writing to promote it, you've got copyright. So I'm glad. I think this is the first time I've ever heard of a company actively working towards utility models. So if I can now go to the what part of my presentation. Uh, sorry, it was now why. Why must your business register PRIs in Kenya? So this one I'll just flip through quickly. So we said is to link your business exclusively to your goods and services and to create clientele. Why? You must also so this protect and grow. These two go hand in hand. It's like in your toolbox. So you're protecting your business from competitors, and now you're also trying to grow your business. So the main business, if, if you're trading, is to make money, to establish client loyalty. From that example that I gave about Coca-Cola, people will buy into the emotional investment in that brand. They'll just think, this is why. That is why some people will prefer Coca-Cola, some people prefer Pepsi or whatever, because there's an association. They are both colors, but why does one prefer the other? There's an emotional attachment. Growing your income from sales and royalties and from licensing, attracting uh, investors and capital. You know, so sometimes uh, opposites do not always attract. You know, if you're a small business and you've got nothing going for you, it might be hard to get a big one. But if you've got your IP, you know, sometimes, you know, same, same will attract each other. So investors will come to you because you've got something that they like, that you're offering, not that you don't have something that they don't want. Um, how can I register my trademarks and other IPRs in Kenya? I was having a bit of a fight with my daughter because I thought I could see a human sign and somebody was saying, when you look at the map of Kenya, what animal do you see? 
I, I, I was seeing a human being with the <laughs> with the, with the nose there. But anyway, that is Kenya on its own. That is Kenya in Africa. I will flip over and then discuss those two areas. So in terms of our IPRs, Kenya is a member of the Aripo trademark system. I will dwell later on the Aripo trademark system, but for now, 22 member states. So you can file one application in Aripo for the registration of patents, utility models, Gloria, and designs. So the Aripo system is different from the OAP system because in Aripo, it's a designation system. You pick and choose the countries that you want. I will dwell uh, on Aripo later. You can also go international, that is for trademarks. Aripo is not, Kenya is not a member of the Aripo Banjo protocol. So whilst you can protect the patents, utility models and designs in Aripo, but you can't protect trademarks, you have to come nationally or either choose the Madrid uh, protocol, which is the international registration. And then other ways in which you can protect your IP, but they are not for registration, but they are for noting, is the PCT. Uh, Kenya is a member of the Patent uh, Cooperation Treaty. It's also a member of the UPOV uh, 91 for the uh, plant variety protection. So for PVP, CAFIS, we have what we call DAS reports uh, for distinctiveness, uniformity, and stability. This take forever. Instead of having to grow your breed from the beginning, there's a system through you, uh, UPOV that enables Kenya to fast track these applications. Uh, we can move on. So I was going now to talk about a repo and the difference. So with your Kenya, for businesses, what I always find it easier is, for example, to imagine a bowl of water and you throw in a stone. The point of impact is your nucleus market. So you might start with Kenya, that's your nucleus market. But when you hit the water, ripples form, don't they? So you start with Kenya, then you think outward. From Kenya, where am I likely to have competitors? Where is the business growing outward? So in that case, you might like to start then in a repo if it is patents, and then you designate out of those member states that you want. The question that I often get is designate uh, 22 Aripo member states in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a patent application. We can't. So the numbers that I always try to get people to remember so far are 22, 20, and 13. These numbers change as member states join. So 22 is the number of countries that are members of a repo. 20 is the number of the maximum countries that you can designate in the Harare Protocol for patents, designs, and utility models. The two that are not members of the Harare Protocol are Somalia and Mauritius. So the rest of them you can. 13 is the number of Aripo member states that have joined the Banjo Protocol for trademarks. And as I mentioned, Kenya is not one of them. There's a reason why there are fewer countries that have joined the Arare, uh, Banjo Protocol for trademarks rather than those one. This is because in most African countries, there is competences available to examine trademarks. So they'd rather keep the work and the income. But for patents, because most of them require substantive examination, these skills are not there. They would rather Aripo does it, and then you get 50-50% fees. This is how the Aripo system works. So Kenya is designable in a patent, utility model, and design applications, not trademarks. Let's flip over. So the Madrid, I'm not trying to be quick because of time. Madrid, Kenya is a member of uh, the Madrid Protocol, which is administered by WIPO. So there are about 130 countries, and they keep joining that you can choose to designate. So in terms of strategy, which is what I'll talk about in the second uh, presentation after break, we can then help each other in terms of how do you designate? You have to be cost sensitive, think of the region, think of where your business is going, and then put a plan and decide which countries am I going to select out of this. But the beauty about the regional and the international system is that you don't have to fly to China and file a trademark application and deal with an agent and their requirements, and then go to Madrid, Spain, deal with another agent, then come to Zimbabwe, deal with Nancy, then go to Malawi, deal with somebody, go to Kenya, deal with Gloria. But it's just one application that allows you to file uh, and manage your trademarks. It simplifies things. So IRS centralized, cost-effective, you can get trademark protection in many countries and many continents. Let's flip over, I'll try to be quicker. So for the registration process, 
If it is in Kenya, you go to Kipi. I put the website there. You can obtain information from a professional IPA agent. Remember, I said professional. <laughs> There's so many of us who are not professional. And then uh, protection mechanisms, you know, you can, uh, you know, I put some websites there. You can enlist, you know, trademark watch services. These are very important. We'll look at the strategy because when you file your trademark, you need to find out what that's being used in some other countries. So the trademark agents will often help you. Let's flip over. And then I'll just talk briefly because the slides are available for you about the Kenya AC recorders because they are tropical. So right now, the requirement is that all IP businesses doing business in Kenya, so that affects EU businesses, they are required, it's a must. You are required to register the IPRS with the Kenya anti counterfeiting Authority, which is the ACA. So the ACA actually says exporting goods to Kenya without their recorders is a criminal offense. And then the recorders are in addition, because most people say, can I do ACA and then I don't register? It's an addition. So the hard deadline for recorders was 1 January 2023, but it has uh, been informally extended. Let's flip over. Um, legislation refers to all types of IPRs, but the general consensus is that it's applying to trademarks only so far. And then uh, ACA is uh, prioritizing these six product categories, alcoholic beverages, pharmaceuticals, electronics, and electro electricals, uh, clothing, footwear, and cosmetics. I think it's because they are the most frequently counterfeited uh, goods. Let's move over. Um, re record the requirements. Uh, written application, prescribed form, details of the IPR. Let's flip over. I'll try to be a bit fast for time because these slides you can get. Product details, clear images and everything. The numerous requirements that are, are required. That is why some people are thinking the recorders are a bit difficult. They're contentious for these very reasons. But the intention, let's flip over. The intention of the ACA uh, is really, you can flip over, flip over. Um, the requirements are there. Um, there is uh, a, valid, a validity period of one year. Then you are supposed to then renew them again. People think it's creating a lot of work for them. But at the end of the day, you have to, you can freeze on that one. With the ACA recorders, you have to think that the ACA is saying we are trying to create a Kenya that is counterfeit free. Uh, business are saying, yes, we agree, but maybe you can modify the system and make it workable. So this is work in progress. And we at Afripi are also working with the Kenya AC Authority to see whether we can find a way of making this easier. And the area that has come up is whether the recorders should be mandatory as they are or whether they can be on a voluntary basis. So we are trying to capacitate the ACA so that they expose to other jurisdictions in terms of which the recorder system is voluntary so that they can assess their mandatory system and see whether we can you know, move uh, and accommodate each other. So, like I was saying, one of the practical considerations for businesses is what happens if our trademark portfolio is too large? Do we have to register, you know, all our, um, our trademarks, you know, because trademarks are in 45 classes, as you can assume. And if you are paying $90, I put the fees there. And then for each additional class, it can be one a very expensive you know, uh, process, and then it can also take some bit of time. So in that case, we encourage that you use maybe registration of the ICA for the housemark, the, the mother trademark, and then you leave it uh, at that so that it's, at least you've got protection. Uh, you can flip over. Um, okay. There, the, the, I think, is the how about the ACA recorders, and then we can move over. Um, okay, you can also find information about the ACA recorders in detail uh, on the AFRIPI um, SME help desk. Um, you, there is an article that is actually dedicated to ACA recorder processes. 